So I wanted to just start with introduce you to a few people, a few people that mean something to me. Um, the first one is this lady. This lady, her name is Yemi Olubade, right? And she, is, she used to be Yemi Ademosu. Why is that important? It's important because my mom used to be Ademosu. So she's my mom's younger sister. To my sisters and I, she's simply Auntie Yam. Auntie Yam. Why is she important? Well, I have some quirks. Like, if you're close to me, really, really close to me, you'll find out those quirks. Now, first of all, if you are, if you, even if you're not close to me, you know I like music. I like music. But I like different forms of music. But there are some that really get me going. They really get me going. Um, and many of you won't listen to that. So, for instance, if you really want to get me going, there's a guy called Bob Fitz. Who knows Bob Fitz? Anybody? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, some of the older people are like, yeah, I know him, but I can't really. I don't want to reveal my age. Uh, you've already revealed it. Zabida, uh, I saw you. All right, the children are like, mommy, who is that? Yeah, right? Well, Bob Fitz. If you don't know who Bob Fitz is, go on iTunes and listen to all those Maranatha uh, uh, albums there. Second, another person I like. This one, I tried in the first service. Only a few people, like three or four people knew. There's a lady called Dupe Ululano, but she used to be called Dupe Sholano. Who knows Dupe Ululano, Sholano? Anybody? Ah, Daddy, thank you, sir. <laughs> to be. It's the only way a daddy in this house. No, she was an old, she's an older um, Yoruba artist, um, Yoruba Christian artist that really ruled in the 80s and the, and the 90s. Now, why is it that those people just, anytime I want to feel good, anytime I want to go back somewhere, why is it that those people have left an imprint in me? It's because of her. My early Christian foundations, my early moral shaping started with her. She lived with us from, literally, from the day I was born, or maybe after the Omugwo, and up until I was nine years old. She lived with us. So every good thing, uh, because there were other uncles and aunties, but the good things, it was Auntie Yam. She taught me at an early stage how to live in the world that was a wicked world. She gave me the things of God to live in that world. But then I want to turn to some other people because those ones taught me to live in the world as a worldly person, but a worldly person not in a bad way. A worldly person that was, that was a bit more cosmopolitan, sophisticated. That's these people. That's Pastor Rotimi and Pastor Bosse Awudumila. Now, she used to be Bosse Oshunui. She's my dad's immediate younger sister. And these people, to my uh, sisters and I, they are simply uncle and auntie. Now, why is that important? You know you've arrived significantly in someone's life when you have, you're, able, or, um, when you're able to turn what I'll call as a title, you turn it into a name. For instance, for all of us, like, when we heard the queen, who are you referring to? Who are you referring to? Not your, not your wife or something. I don't know who somebody said something there. But if we said the queen, most of us refer to who? Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth, right? Elizabeth II of United Kingdom. Only God knows what they said in that place. <laughs> we don't want to know. Keep it to yourselves. Keep it to yourselves. My God. Oh, no. Any time you heard the queen, you were thinking of Queen Elizabeth the second. Now, we said the queen, but she was Elizabeth. She was the second Elizabeth, and she was of the United Kingdom. She wasn't the queen of the whole world, but we often refer to her as the queen because... She, had the, she was probably the most significant monarch of our time. And in that way, my aunt and uncle, we don't qualify their names. We don't say Auntie Bosse or Uncle Rutimi. We just say Auntie and Uncle. Every other aunt and uncle have to qualify with their actual names. Why? These ones made such a deep impact on my sisters and I. You know, when my parents were so rigid and trying to get us to do our books and everything, these were the ones that took us to National Arts Theater. Gone, who knows where? Okay, yes. You see it. You know that... Uh, when you are going on Echo Bridge. Okay, let's just leave it there. But then, National Theatre, and after we finish plays, right, we'll now come out, we'll eat suya there, there's be suya. Now, some people used to say that that suya was not beef suya, that it was actually horses or camels or um, uh, donkeys or things like that. I don't know, but the thing was sweet, huh? uh, if you lived, If you lived in Surulay, anybody lived in Surulay or lives in Surulay, who knows Akereli? Akereli. Now, in Akereli, there was something called Akereli meat pie. Hey, God. If you've not tasted a curly meat pie, you don't know what heaven tastes like. 
Like I'm telling you, there was no meat pie like a Kerry, Kerry Lee meat pie. We also had UTC. UTC, they used to sell what they call cereal burger. And my aunt and uncle would take us there. All those things. Um, how I learned how to play draft. Draft, you know how they say, like, um, if you must be the master, the student must some, at some point kill the master. You understand? My uncle was, he was the master, I was the student. And my only goal in life, particularly when I was 10, going to 11, was I just needed to beat him. And you know that sort of, when somebody is coming, you know, you know they're coming, coming. I can't forget the day I beat him in draft. I became a master that day. All right? So, you know, when I say grand quiz master, there are many ways I got that master anyway. So, they were the ones that did all of those things for us. My monopoly, all of those things. In fact, it's so, it was so significant that, you know, Nigerians, we like to fill a lot of forms. And in our forms, you have all these irrelevant things, state of origin, blah, blah. But there's always one there, next of kin, next of kin. My sisters and I never thought twice about who we put as next of kin. It was always them. Why am I saying all of this? Why am I introducing you to these people? I thank God for who, what, who and what my parents have been to us, right? And the, the primary shaping of my life from the early years of my life was by my parents. There was the primary responsibility given to them, but also the, the primary uh, impact that was made was because of my parents. However, I'm not who I am today if not for the contributions of Auntie Yam and Auntie and Uncle in other words, the reason why they are so important is this. Whilst my parents had the primary responsibility of parenting us, parenting was never designed to be uh, uh, only exclusively given to parents. It was always meant to be a collaborative endeavor. Did you hear what I said? Parenting, though, is primary with the parents, but it was always meant to be a collaborative endeavor. With who? With people we can specifically call helpers. They are helpers that God sends our way whether by our uh, connection to them by uh, blood or whatever, but there are people that enable our children to become who they are meant to become, who God has proposed them to be, for them to become by helping us. Now, in the last couple of weeks, we've spoken about how we must envision something for our children. We must have a plan that we invest in. Yes, all of those things are important. But if you want to see those children become what your plan and your investment and all your vision, what you want them to be, you need helpers. And I pray that at the end of the day, when we are finished here, you know how to attract those helpers and you know how to be a helper in Jesus' name. All right, so before that, I must put in the disclaimers that I've been putting all along. If I am critiquing anything here, I'm not critiquing you personally. Shekbo, you here? All right? Please don't come and email me or text me or anything. All right? And if I say any good thing about myself, I'm not bragging. I'm just giving you facts. All right? No, I'm not bragging. Seriously. Okay, um, also I, I identified unique parenting situations as well, single parents, people with special needs, children. Um, but also finally, this sermon and the whole series is not only for parents, it's not for soon-to-be parents, it's not just for aspiring parents, it's for non-aspiring parents because there's a lot that you can learn in life and leadership with this. Okay, so with all of that being said, we're going to look at three, this sermon in three points, and we have a lot to say, and we still have to pray today. So, three points, getting the helpers, being a helper, following the helper. Hmm? Did you get that? Getting the helpers, being a helper, and following the helper. So, let's begin. Getting the helpers. So, as we've seen in the previous uh, verses in 1 Chronicles 22, David had a vision for his son, Solomon. He was to be a temple builder. It was the vision that God gave. David had a plan. David was invested in that plan, right? All of those things, yes. But there was one more component that was left. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, it says, Then David ordered all the leaders of Israel. Somebody say all the leaders. All the leaders. To help, to help his son, Solomon. David knew he couldn't do it alone. This thing about building this vision, it's not meant to be, I will talk to him, I will encourage him, I'll do all of those, but I still need helpers. If Solomon is going to be who, I want him to be who God has called him to be. We've often heard the phrase that it takes a village to do what? 
to raise a child. And David understood that. Now, in the same way David participated in the building of the temple in that he provided the things that were there, listen to what David tells these people in verse 19. He doesn't just say help, but he tells them exactly what they are meant to do. After he says, devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord, he then says, you begin to build the sanctuary of the Lord God. In other words, they are meant to partake in this temple building that Solomon ultimately is meant to do. My point is this. They are part, they are collaborating with David to enable Solomon to be who God has called him to be. Now, for many of us, as I was speaking about the extended family, some of us, we also experience the same thing. But we know that times are changing, and many times our extended family just don't be with us. Right? You finish school, they don't want to come to your house, they don't want to take care of your children, they jack bar, all of those kinds of things. So we need to find an alternative extended family for many of us. Cue in the church. The church, irrespective of how many people jack bar or not, there will always be people that will be there. Right? The church is meant to be an extension. In fact, it's meant to be the primary family because at the end of the day, when we get into the new heavens and new earth, all these are family relations, don't really exist. What does exist that is that we have one Father, we have one God. We are that family. And so everything I'm going to say today, I'm really talking to us as a church, a city church, here is our responsibilities, okay? So when we think about these helpers, I want you to think in two ways. One way you should think about the helpers, the journey of getting helpers, you should think intellectually and you should think intergenerationally. We must think intellectually and intergenerationally. Say intellectually. Intergenerationally. Let's start with intellectual, first of all. Intellectually, here's my main exhortation. Learn from experts. Learn from experts. I'll say it one more time. Learn from experts. Why do I have to keep repeating it? Because we live in a time where all of a sudden we don't appreciate experts. Either we don't even acknowledge them to be experts, or we just don't appreciate experts because we pride ourselves in learning things and doing things on our own. What cannot be learned on YouTube today? So we say. But listen, I want to say, especially for those who have not yet started parenting, you will not find, I've said this before about myself, there is no more difficult thing I've ever had to do in my entire life, not even pastoring, that compares with parenting children. It's the most difficult thing is the most challenging thing. Parenting is hard, and I don't have enough sense to do it on my own. If you become the kind of person that says, eh, I'll figure this thing out, I don't need other people. Listen, that is arrogance. And usually, this kind of arrogance precedes ignorance. The worst form of ignorance is ignorance that is accompanied by arrogance. You need to learn from experts. There are people that have actually learned this thing and gone ahead of you. How do you learn from them? Well, you can get books, or you can um, uh, listen to talks, specifically on parenting, or you can go for seminars, seminars on parenting, right? Um, I know a church, a couple of, uh, not too uh, long ago, right? They, they did a parenting seminar for the entire church. And maybe about 40% of them showed up, right? The ones that showed up obviously are not arrogant and they are no longer ignorant. <laughs> Uh, the ones that didn't show up, well, you know, there's always chance for them again, right? Somebody say no shade. Yeah, all right, no shade is being thrown at anybody here. Okay, but really, seriously, because if, when we just sort of, eh, you know, who, is, is he really talking to me? Anybody that came for a parenting seminar about two weeks ago will tell you that they did not leave, that they did not leave without saying, oh, I as a pastor myself, I said, ooh, wow, are you following what I'm saying? Learn from experts. Somebody will say, eh, but there's so much information out there, this, 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 that, that, that. Ah, I don't want an overdose of information. I agree. Don't have an overdose of information. But if you've ever been sick and you went to the doctor, even though you knew about overdose of medication, we all know this. The solution to overdose is not zero dose. You don't say because somebody has overdosed on malaria medicine and he killed them, uh, when I have malaria, I'm never taking medicine again. Do we say that? No, that's ignorant. Learn from experts. Get equipped. But that's not where I'm spending my time. I'm really spending my time intergenerationally. Maybe I should proceed with this story. Right? One of the most significant things that happened in the life of the kingdom of Israel was the split. Uh, Israel eventually split into two kingdoms. How did that happen? Here's the backstory. 
after Solomon died, so even though we're with David and Solomon, Solomon eventually came to the throne, but he ruled for 40 years, and then he died. His son, Rehoboam, eventually came to the throne. Now, you know how we talk about the first 100 days. You want to be able to establish yourself, take control. So Rehoboam was thinking, how can I take control? How can I show I am not Solomon, and that now the kingdom has been passed to me? So what happened was some people came to meet him, representatives of the 12 tribes, and said, ah, bros, see, eh? your father was hard to us. But we swear we'll serve you. Just lighten the load. Treat us less harshly than your dad did in terms of our work. So he thought, hmm, okay. Let me consult two sets of people. So he consulted elders and young men. The elder said, oh, okay, I'll follow with them all, right? In fact, if you do so, they will really be loyal to you. He thought, hmm, okay. Then he consulted the young men. The young men said, these old people, these old people, this is how they've been trying to do things. See, if you want them to respect you more than your father did, right, you need to really put your leg down. I said, hey, this one seems, all you hope you forget. Forget, that's not the way we do things. Now, he says, you know, my father put a yoke, a heavy yoke on you. I will make it heavier. They say, ah, no, no, he said, let me even explain. My father whipped you. Uh, my father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. And at that point, they now said, your father, your grandfather, that's David, right? Go. Your house is to you, David, but to, uh, um, to our tents go all what? Israel. And this is how the kingdom split. Ten, ten tribes, two tribes. One of the most significant things that happened there. Now, I don't want to get into the biblical theological significance of all of this. What I do want to point out is this. And the writer is that it takes uh, pains to show us this, that it was when he rejected the advice of the elders and took the advice of the young men, there was something sociological there. In fact, it played into the perennial intergenerational battle that we all have. Every generation thinks their generation is the best. Every generation. They always think. They think the old ones don't really understand anything. They think the younger ones are spoiled. They said that about you. Now you are saying it about the other ones. Am I lying? And here's the problem. God allows diversity. Like, look at our church now. We are, they are different generations, right? We have, our church, we have people from early 20s. Most, in fact, we have people up until their, their, their 70s, right? We have that, and, but, you know, the vast majority are maybe from, like, mid-20s to about early, uh, mid-40s. Now, here's the thing. That diversity is important, but that diversity will not be used if what happens is we look at each other with suspicion. If we look at each other with suspicion, we will eventually be divided. But if we look at each other with understanding, we will eventually be united. And then we can use our strength, the strength of our diversity. Can I say it again? We often lead with suspicion. And that leads to division. This is the way they've been doing it. It doesn't work for them. They are spoiled, all of those things. But what if we understood each other better? What if we understood in summary, the dynamics working in each generation. This is why I like what Pastor John Tyson eventually did. It's called, he put, it's called the arc of life. It's a summary of each stage in our life, what is going on. He starts from, they will call it high school, we'll call it senior secondary. What's senior secondary characterized by? It's characterized by exposing. It's at this point people are exposed to new ideas. They now start, hey, look at this. Oh, have you? They start saying, have you ever heard of Martin Luther King Jr.? Right? Have you ever heard the, I heard the dream speech? Like, guy, <laughs> right? They're just being exposed to new things. But by the time they get to university, they've been exposed to a lot. Now they're trying to learn. The difference between being exposed and learning, now they're learning things a little bit more. But they are learning things in an abstract way, in a theorized way. So that when they enter into their 20s and they go out into the real world, now what they have been exposed to and what they've been learning, they want to put it into practice but it's still in an idealized form. So that's where they come in and say, we want to save the world. We want to eradicate poverty. They say that all oh, these governments are all terrible. All we need is a government of the youth. <laughs> but then they enter into their 30s. It's in your 30s you start to do what we call editing. After life has hit you, you now say, you know what? I'm not eradicating poverty for anybody, just for myself. <laughs> Right? This is why, you know, politically, they always say that most students start from the left, and as you grow older, you move towards the right. 
Once you start having property, you start saying, ah, no, 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 taxes, all of those kind of things. So they move from editing. Now, after the veterinary and said, no, this is not who I am, this is not blah, blah. By the time you get to your 40s, it's now focus. And that is the place of mastery. You start to master things. By the time you get to your 50s, the things that you've labored for in your 30s and your 40s, you now start harvesting. You know somebody that is in that phase or has gone through that phase, the way they walk into church, they can't run. You see you people in 20s and 30s, you're always moving fast because life is happening to you. But by the time you're in first, you're 50s, you know, you're not harvesting like, oh, say, cool down, cool down, all this, you know, 50s harvesting, 60s, now you now start identifying people, you are okay, you now identify people that you want to be guiding, it is guiding. 70s is now so much wisdom that you want to pour out, so now you are imparting. 80s, you are just savoring life. 90s, you are preparing to meet with your maker. <laughs> Hundreds is not there, but I just say hundreds is enjoying in the presence of God because you are dead. <laughs> All right? So, here's the point I like. Now, of course, now we don't want, it's quite, it's quite a summary, but here's the point. If we understand where people are going through, rather than be irritated by them not understand, uh, not behaving like you are behaving in your own generation, we will be able to unite a whole lot more. This is important. Are you following? Because once you do that, now... You can learn from helpers whether they are old or whether they are young. For those of us who are parents, we can learn from those who are old and those who are young. Let me help you with those two things, right? Help um, um, learning from those who are older. The way you learn from those who are older is two things, observing and listening. But before you do that, before you can get that, let me tell you, there's a key to unlock those things from them. You know what the key is? Whenever you meet old people, honor them. Honor them. What does honor mean? It means acknowledge what they have, celebrate what they have, and reward what they have. You see certain things in them, acknowledge it. And not just acknowledge it, praise them for it. And also reward them for it. So when you tell them, ah, I want to come and learn this thing for me, I see that you are blah, blah. Oh, you are not just acknowledging, you are celebrating. I like the way you people do this, and I like the way your family is, blah, blah. When somebody says, what is reward? Buy them presents. Say, really? But they have more than me. No, I'm telling you, I'm giving you advice now. It says something about value. I'll pack that one. Just leave it. Do whatever you think you want to do. But now, if you do that, the two things you can get from them, by observing and listening. Observing is your frequent teacher. Listening is your deepest teacher. Observing is your frequent teacher. Listening is your deepest teacher. Observe, by observing, you don't need a class. You can just watch them. Watch them with their kids. Watch them in church. Watch them around. Now, here's the thing. What honor does is this. You can, it, you, they, it gives you access to them. So you don't just access them in the public space. They're able to give you access into their lives, their personal lives, so that you can observe more of the secret source of what is happening. The thing with observation is that sometimes they're not even able to articulate what it is they're doing and why. But you're able to put the things together. Now, with that being said, there are some things you want to be able to ask. That is where listening comes. As you've observed them for a period of time, you have certain questions that you want to say, okay, so how does this work? You bring perceptive questions. Are you following me? They will know that you've been observing. They will know that you, are, you admire something in them because you've honored them, and now you can then ask them questions. But let me sound one note of caution. When you are asking them questions, don't ever, 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 when they give you answers, don't ever correct them. I say that because I see it a lot. Don't ever what? Correct them. Why do I say that? Is it that they're always right? No. Do you think they think they're always right? No. But here's the point. You are the one that came to learn. You didn't say that I was coming to come and debate with you, did you? So if you go and you now start correcting them at that point, guess what? They would go back and forth, and eventually they will leave you. Then you now want to ask them another question. Why do you need me again? Now, here's the point. It's not that you are saying everything is right. It's that you are doing the editing process at the wrong time with the wrong people. Go back home, compare with what you think God says, how God has called you, and say, okay, all of this part I get and I will apply. This other one I don't. Because when you correct them, when you sort audience with them, and you correct them, you know what it is? It's dishonoring. And dishonor, dishonor always closes doors in the same way honor opens doors. Are you hearing me? Now, that is for older people. How about younger people? The reason why, let me say this to parents, why you must, you need to learn, you should be humble and learn 
from younger people is this. There are certain things that they, there are certain ways, there are certain access they have to your children, children that you will never have. Younger adults, they just have a certain way and access to your children that you will never have. Chidima told us in that seminar, she used a phrase, she called secure attachment, that your children feel safe with some people and they are attached with those people. It is different from you because, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. They just can't attach to you in that way. They attach to you in another way. Are you following me? Now, that is why for us, my wife and I, we have been beneficiaries of this. Our, our children are surrounded with uncles and aunts that have been so helpful to us. So you say, how do I attract some of these? Because there are abusers out there. I know there are abusers out there. So let me give you three tips plus one bonus. Three tips plus one bonus on how you attract those kinds of people that will be helpful to you, younger people. The first one is this, genuinely invest in these people. Genuinely invest in them, not because of what you want to get from them. That is, some of the younger people around, see some things in them, bring them close. Try to find out how they're doing. Find out about their relationship. Find out about their work. Find out if you show genuine interest in them. Here is the effect. I am not saying do this because of the effect. I'm saying do this on its, on its own. But here is the effect. They will feel so indebted to you, but they know they can't pay you back because most of the time you are more advanced in life than them. So you know what they'll do? That debt that they feel, they will joyfully want to pay it forward to your children. Do you think of what I'm saying? They will joyfully, the debt, the, all the advice, the things that worked out for them, all the things that I did for them, they will just be wondering, like, how, how can I repay this person? I can't repay this person, but I can pay it forward, your children. So invest in them. Second thing is this, choose wisely. Choose what? Wisely. All right? So we choose, the people that we choose to really have more access to our children are people that we observe to f that freely spend, I use the word spend, spend time, spend money with our, uh, uh, on our children, right? Buying them gifts, presents, all of those things. Or people that invite them over to their place. And finally, people that have something to offer. You must have a quality to offer. I'm not just going to allow you because you think you look... Nice, right? If I don't see that your head is a bit straight, you will say hi to my children from here, you won't come to my house. Because I don't want you to pass the thing that you don't have to them. You know, you can, that's called addition, subtraction by addition. All right? So, but there are people that just generally, I can see the love that they have for our children by spending doing all these things. I'll say a little bit more about them in the second point. So you choose wisely. And then the third thing is this. Give freedom. This one is controversial. Give those adults freedom. What do I mean by that? Give them, let them form genuine relationships with your children. Not relationships, not, don't allow them to be proxies for you. Where they are, they, uh, those adults become like moles. Like, okay, uh, my child, I'm not one, he, he's always checking something at night. I can't hear. What if you got close to him? And if you get close to him, you'll not be my informant. You know that kind of thing. No. Let your children have genuine relations with them. And let me tell you how, the, the number one sure proof, uh, the way you can uh, really establish this. Give them the freedom to learn things from your children that they don't have to tell you. The freedom not to tell you everything that they know. Some of you are here. You have a 15-year-old daughter. And you're like, you telling people, ah, thank God for my children. She can never have a boyfriend. What that auntie knows is that she's on her third boyfriend. <laughs> now, the reason the auntie doesn't tell you, and thank God, is that you don't want to have, you don't want to have heartbreak. Eh? Three boyfriends. How? I, said, I, I, I didn't tell you she was dating two of them at the same time. <laughs> you say, my God. The reason is this. If they, if they are informants or moles, eventually your children will sniff. Your children are smarter than you think. They will sniff that this person doesn't genuinely care about me. So eventually what would they do? They will lock up. So you have to have people in your children's lives that know things that they don't tell you. But the final thing I'll say, with, those are the main things. The gyra I would say is this. Investigate them. Not at the beginning, I mean as the relationship is going. Just, you know, sometimes just, ah, you went out with Uncle this. What happened? Ah, we went, to, we went to his house. He just said that we should be playing one new game. We should just take off our shirt and our trousers and be running. He said, wow, really? Okay. 
So the next two weeks, he comes again. He wants to carry your children out. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. You are never going out with it. Just, but just occasionally ask, how? I never try to let your children believe it's a leading question. But you're just finding out different things. How was that day? What did you guys do? All of those things. Just to reinforce that you're not being careless. Is this helpful? Now, if you do that, that was to parents. Let me tell you, in my wife's life and mine, we, because of this, through these relationships, our kids have experienced a lot, they've learned a lot, and they have been saved from a lot in a way that my wife and I could never, ne- if we were, we're doing it alone, it would never happen. So if that's the case, I want us to talk about being a helper. So now I want to address those who are not parents or those who are helping with other people's children. Being a helper, right? So I've discussed the thing with the parents. Now to you non-parents, can I just start and say, in this church, and really in most church, in churches, you people who don't have children, which is why I'm so glad a lot of you are coming for this series, you hold a special place, a real special place. As I said, this is a family. These children, they are not your biological children, but God has appointed you to them in one way or the other. All the, the fate of our children also lies with you guys. There is something about helping with parenting. It leads me to a very fascinating story in Exodus chapter 1. Now, here's what happened. The Hebrews, right, initially were not in Egypt. What happened was that God had, um, through providence, had made a guy called Joseph enter into Egypt. We all know, well, a lot of us know his story. He rises, he comes, he, become, he was a slave, but he rises to become the second in command. He institutes some economic policies that saves Egypt. In a time of famine, they didn't go hungry. They were even lending to many people. So as a result of that, his family, 70 people, eventually move into Egypt. Over 400 years, they multiply, multiply more than the Egyptians, so much so that the king of Egypt now starts to think, this new king of Egypt after 400 years, now starts to think they're a threat. And this guy didn't know Joseph. He didn't know what happened uh, with Joseph. So he comes up with a policy, right? And it's a policy very similar to a policy that we have now. Let's look at it in Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, right? When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Stop. Stop. Go back. Go back. Go back. I just want this as an aside, and it came to me in the first service, I just want to say it. Notice that these women helped. Their job was to help. He was now telling them, eh, you can also help them in another way, helping them in a way that leads to the loss of life. What they were helping was in a way that brought about life. He's saying there are times that you have to help people that leads to a loss of life. Can I say, this is why, as Christians, we all should be against abortion. We all should be against abortion because what we are telling doctors who swear an oath to bring life, to try to preserve life, we are telling them, we are reversing what it is that they are meant to do and telling them they should take life. Now, if you want to talk about when the mother's life is at stake, all of these things that form about less than 1% of what you, you know, people fa- uh, 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 face, we can talk about that, the complexities of that. But don't use something that is less than 1% to try to say this should be a policy that caters for over 99% of stuff. I will park that there. Come back. So verse 17, here's what these women did. The midwives, however, feared God and did not want and did, and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. In other words, O oh king, you are great. There is a king that is greater than you. O oh king, we respect you, but this other king, we fear you. And so, O oh king, these children of the people of God, even though they are in a vulnerable situation, we will do everything to protect them from the forces that are against them. God bless Shipra and poor. Let me say this. You guys who are not yet parents or you guys who still have some kind of responsibility for other people's children, the ministry God is giving to you is the ministry of Shipra and poor. That is, in a world where the people of God's children are going to be in that world and are at risk of many things, God is saying, not just at childbirth, and childbirth is important, all right? Shika and Kenneth will tell you that, uh, Dami and Sarah, all these people that are expected, they need you. Moji and uh, uh, Tomua, right now, they need you but not just at childbirth, throughout the parenting journey, particularly in the infant stage to the teenage stage. We need you. Can I say one more time? We need you. Now, if, we, if I say we need you, we need you in a particular way. There are ways we don't need you. 
So that would make me examine yet another graph, right? I want to examine four kinds of adults, four kinds of adults. And it's on this, it's, um, with this tension of adults, when we relate with children, we're either trying to connect with them or we're trying to correct them. And we feel a tension, this connection and correction, all right? So we're going to use a graph, that, that, all right? The horizontal axis connection, the vertical axis correction. And let's examine four kinds of adults. The first one is what we'll call superficial adults, superficial adults. Who are they? They, they are seasonally friendly. And they care more about their image of being cool with kids than caring for those kids. Right? They promise a lot, deliver a little. Occasionally, they make sacrifices, but mostly checks out when time and effort with the kids, that significant time and effort with the kids, costs them. But having, because they've done some things with the children, they always wonder why these kids don't appreciate them much. Why is it that that one is your favorite uncle? Minko, why is it that that one is your favorite auntie? Minko. Now, before you think I'm talking to you, uh, this is me. I, uh, this is me. I like to be every child's favorite uncle. It's not that I like to. In fact, all your children here, ask them who their favorite uncle is. PF. PF, right. Even though I just don't give them the kind of time to deserve that title. All right? And I'm saying, look, some of us have that tendency. And the, the result of this is that you may make some impact with the children. Don't be surprised that you don't really make um, um, uh, um, um, a deep impact. Why? Because you are not really connected to the children. Second one, the connected adults. Who are these ones? These people genuinely love the kids. They spend quality time with them. The kids tell them deep things because they prioritize listening to them in a non-condescending way. But they are wary of ever isolating the kids. And because of that, they now prioritize listening and connection over giving advice or correction. Thus, when the time comes for them to either give some kind of advice or correction, because they've never practiced it, they actually don't know how to do it. And those times do come. So here's what the result of those people. Those people, they connect with the kids, but they don't make a deep, lasting impact with the children. These are the people that always want to just show that they are children. You are, you are 56, but yet you still want to dress like, you are, you are like, you know, your, your, t your polo is too, too tight, your belly is coming out, right? You are 55, you are still wearing skinny jeans, right? You should be wearing a boo-boo. The children actually are a little bit embarrassed by you. But you're like, hey, what's going on? You even say fashy to them. Fashy? <laughs> so we're just trying to be cool. We're just trying to be cool. Right? No, they are children and you are an adult. So that's the thing with the connected people. Here's the third one. These people, this third one is the overbearing one because they've seen the connected ones. These are the people, who are these people? These are the people that they have an innate ability to find out what is spoiled in spoiled children. <laughs> right? These are the people, you've ever, if you've ever heard that phrase, children of nowadays, or this generation. If you've ever said that, well done, you are an overbearing person. <laughs> All right? Now, they will claim that the endless discussion about the ills of children or their consistent correction of them is born out of, they will even call it tough love. But listen, they lack an ounce of patience to back it up. The children usually can't stand them. In fact, some of them, they detest them. And let me quickly say this. And I said this here. I just wrote it down here. I don't, if you're this kind of person, I won't lie, I don't want your judgmental self. And the self is a clean word. That's not the word there. I, say, I don't want your judgmental self. You know, I'm preaching now, so I can't say. Yeah, I don't want your judgmental self around my kids. You may be right about the faults of my kids, but your overbearing self and your lack of empathy is worse off than the wrongs that my children do. These are the worst kinds of people. No one then. You're not producing anything. In fact, why? They eventually make no connection and no impact on the children. They just run away from you. If you want to know those kind of people, whenever you just tell your children, hey, auntie, whatever is coming, and they just look one kind, you know. But now you can be, the final one is the helpful adult. These are the people that deeply love the kids. They treat their views and opinions with respect. Allow them to speak more than they, are, uh, they speak to the children. They spend quality time with them, effortlessly spend uh, money on them, and eventually, what do they do? They gain the trust of children. But they are able to maintain the adult-kid 
distinction. And as a result of that, they're able to advise them skillfully or correct them tactfully and explicitly where it is needed. And they do so, and this is the crucial bit, whilst they correct and advise, they never lose the trust of the children. They never do what? Lose the trust of the children. They know how to involve the parent when needed. And so what is the result of this kind of helpfulness? They make the deepest lasting impact on their kids. How many of us want to be helpful adults? I do. So I want to give you seven ways that you can become a helpful adult. Not because I know this very well, but because I observe all the uncles and aunts around my children. So this is going to be sort of like an ode to all these aunts and uncles around my children. Now, let me quickly say this, because there are quite many. If I don't call your name and you have made an impact, it's not what personal. Please don't be angry, eh? Okay? I know it was risky doing this thing, but I know some of you have done well. First one, listen. Listen. You can be a helpful adult by listening. When I mean that, listen, a lot of people condescend to children. They just condescend. Okay, so that 11-year-old is crying that that girl broke up with him, that she broke up with him, and now she's now dating her, his, his best friend. Terrible guy. All right, dating his best friend. And you, you, your own first thing is like, but you're 11, you shouldn't. No. You're like, oh, oh, this one that I just crying now. Forget it. See, by the time you get married, we will laugh about these things. This one, you're, you're being cruel. Because... That 11-year-old, as far as that 11-year-old is, do you know how many times he did, she loves me, she loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not. And eventually he landed with she loves me. Do you know how many times he has thought about what they could be together? For him, that is the end of the world. <laughs> Listen to him first. Because he will eventually be 18, and he will think about that nonsense that happened there. But he will always remember that whether he was 11 or he was 18, you were always allowing him to speak. Are you hearing? Don't trivialize what they are going through. Listen, right? Kids need places for self-expression. That's why they need to talk. If they are going to develop, self-expression is a key for children to develop. Another thing why they need to speak, because sometimes they need outlet vows that are not their parents, because quite often it's because of their parents they need outlet vows, so they can't go to their parents. Second one, this is my favorite, create memories. Create memories. I told you about my aunt and uncle, how I still remember a lot of the things that they do, right? Oh, so by the way, I should say, the first one, listening, that's why we have Auntie Dara in my children's life, because she listens to them. She listens to them. She actually listens. Many times I don't listen as much, but she always hears. No matter, there's nothing. There's nothing. Like when I found out about my uh, one, the youngest one in primary school, he's been heartbroken a few times. He's been heartbroken. He's been heartbroken. Yes. Yes, he's seven. Yes, he's seven. <laughs> I tell him all the time, I said, this person that you're kidding, the father will come, and, will come against me, but, you know, let's leave that. But that, anyway, let's just leave that one. All right, create moments, create moments, right? Moments, that's why. Uncle Ben, Uncle Ben swims with my children. Uncle Tomwa plays video games with them. Uncle Tedu and Aunt Sucha take them out and spend their own money, right? Uncle Toki, Uncle Toki and Auntie Tomisi, they invite them over. Uncle Francis and Auntie Kechi, they invite them over. And when they're inviting them and doing all of these things, you know what they're doing? They're creating memories. But maybe I should, I should, share, I should share with you, I should share with you um, uh, one, I want to show you this video about one that I know that my children will not forget in time, all right? Permit the sound, you may not audibly really hear what they are saying, but uh, just, just witness the whole event, all right? It's just about a minute and 15 seconds. Sir. So this is our English breakfast, and you probably won't see a better one than this. Now, as we are good, this is the bacon and sausage. Ooh, we can't see the bacon. Can we? Yes, we can. You can see some of the bacon here. Um, look at the toast. And uh, look at the toast. And this is James' bread that he bought for himself because he's picky. And look at the <laughs> cranberry juice that we bought. Um, yes, it's in our cups, and then we have some very big beans. The big beans was made by Auntie Sarah, the sauce was made by Auntie Sarah, um, the um, bacon was made by Auntie Sarah, the mushrooms was made by Tayo, and the egg was no. fried by me and Jaden and Abby. And, and the mushrooms were cut by well. me. Tayo. And, and the mushrooms were cut by me. And the mushrooms were cut by me. And the mushrooms were cut by Tayo. And fried by Tayo. And now they can barely wait to a good spread. Thank you, God, for giving us food. Thank you, God, for giving us food. For his breath 
Now, if you are watching that, just saying, what's wrong with this truth? How can you be using Superman song to actually do prayers? <laughs> you're, just, you're, just, you're just being stuck up. Or maybe you have observed the table and be like, what? They're using, they're giving children margarine planter, right? Or is it blue band? This sort of butter. What happened to the butter? I'm not saying that's what I saw. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know. But, but, but here's the point, guys. Every midterm, once a year, every midterm, Sarah and Dami invite my children over, and they do things like cooking, they spend time, they go, they do adventurous stuff that my wife and I will never be able to give them. They will not forget this thing in their 30s. They will not forget in their 40s. Create memories for them. The next one is very related. It is sharing your stories, sharing stories or memories. This is so important. Why? Because I'm talking about sharing your own life's journey. Sometimes it's just... I remember when I was growing up, I used to like older cousins coming around. I didn't go to boarding school. They would always tell us tales about boarding school, all of these things. Of course, a lot of it was juiced up, Mama Koi Koi, and all these different things. Right? It was all juiced up. And maybe when you're sharing with the children, I'll say juice it up as well. I'm not saying lie, but it's much more. Sprinkle a little bit. Why? Because memories fuels their imagination. I don't know how many of you watched uh, Muppet Babies. Anybody? Muppet, Muppet Babies, Muppet Babies. Uh -huh. It was, ah, Zabida to you again. All right, okay. All right, Muppet Babies, it was a cartoon, old cartoon. It was all about imagination. Children need to fire their imagination. Why? Because it's imagination that eventually leads to innovation. You are creating something in their brain, not just telling them solve math. There's analysis, but you need imagination as well. So share your stories with them. That's why our children had anti-faith, our children have anti-gloria. They share a lot of their stories with them. And they always come and tell us. That's how we know what's going on in their lives. All right? But teach, teach, teach as well. Do you know that studies have, have shown that the number one factor that makes children after university still remain Christians is an attachment to an adult, an adult that is also a Christian that is not their parents. An attachment to an adult that is not their parents that is also a Christian. Because at that point, remember what we said about they're learning, they're being exposed, and so they need somebody to share something with, and they don't want their parents. But it may not just be about Christian doctrine. It may just be mathematics. It may be about money. It may be things. Teach them, equip them. God has given you something to be able to say. The next one is very related. Advice. Your voice can get through to them in a way their parents Voices cannot get to them because you've built enormous social capital with them. I mean, there was somebody in this church that the person didn't want to uh, finish school. Uh, I, I didn't know. We were first sharing about our views on education. We were big fans of a guy called Sakan Robinson. We finished talking for like one and a half hours. We were talking about the education system in Nigeria, blah, blah. So by the time the person finished, the person now said, that's why he didn't want to finish uh, his final year in university and his parents. His parents don't, yeah, just, you know, like, this thing doesn't produce anything. I stopped the conversation. I said, Oga, you will finish you. You will finish that university. The guy thought, ah, but I thought, I said, you finish. Be part of the system, finish from the system, then change the system. <laughs> and till today, the parents, eh, in fact, if they, they, can't, they wanted to give me trophy because he finished. I could get through that person in a way that the parents couldn't. My children, I wanted them to learn about hard work. The hard work leads to success. But they really didn't understand that until they went out with Uncle Femi. They realized, they came Femi, they said, ah, He's the only one that drives the G-Wagon. And they entered that G-Wagon, took them for ice cream, and they said, how can we do this? And they said, work hard. I said, ah, that makes sense. I said, because daddy, you're working hard. Look at the kind of car you're driving. <laughs> this guy, now we understand. Sixth, extra support. Parents need practical and spiritual support. Particularly, I want to make this case, particularly for our parents that are single parents, particularly for single moms. Listen, guys. It is hard enough for two parents to raise one child, believe me. Imagine what it is for a single parent to raise two children. It's very difficult. And we have many of them around us. For us, in our own life, right, in our lives, when it comes to setting up electronics in our house, anytime we buy any kind of electronics, right, in our house, I don't do it. That's right for the truth. I don't do it. I've never, I just buy, or, you know, we call Uncle Ben. Uncle Ben comes and sets everything up, right? 
um, whenever we go, maybe we travel, and somehow we travel, our children are always falling sick, right? Auntie Pelumi and Uncle Mano, they go to the hospital. They visit them there, among other people, Uncle Ibube, Auntie Ibukun, they're always there. Sometimes Auntie Ibukun will sleep over. See, and when I mean sleep over, I mean sleep either on a chair or sleep on the bed with the child. Sometimes also when, we, when school runs, my wife can't make it, I can't make it. Uncle Emmanuel has done it for years counting. Extra support. Finally, I love this one, snitch. Be a snitch. I know, I know. Snitches get stitches, right? But sometimes the stitches are okay, it's not bad. But what I mean by be a positive snitch, let me remind you, you are the helper, not the parent. And even though I know that there are things that you should not say, there are some things at some point you have to say, I have to bring in the parent. I don't know how many of you have heard of Roblox. Roblox, anybody? Right? Roblox is an online gaming platform. Zabida so didn't raise her hand up that time. No, you did. Oh, you actually do. Okay. Right, it's an online gaming platform. You can play games with people all around the world. You can even create games, put it on that platform, and all of those things. Right? I never heard of Roblox. I didn't know. But one of the dangers with Roblox is this. Because you have access to all these people all around the world to play games, eventually they start chatting you up. And that's one of the biggest dangers. Until one day, and one of our children was on Roblox, and I didn't know. And Auntie Dara found out. And she found out that somebody had started chatting. And at that point, she said, eh, I know there are certain things that I shouldn't tell, but you guys need to know about this. And here's what we did. We eventually had conversations. And listen, this is really important. Many times when we find out certain things that our children know through our informants, no, through the helpful adults, <laughs> right? <laughs> through the helpful adults. You know what we, we, we've successfully not, uh, not done till now? We always skillfully lead the children on to talk about it, to confess it. They never know that we're speaking about the adult. Because that, that adult told us, because we want to make that relationship sacred. Are you following what I'm saying? Guys, these seven tips, and there can be more. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. And I didn't, I, there are many people I didn't call, I'm sorry. But here's what I'm trying to tell you. If my parenting is not perfect, my children are not perfect, but I actually think my children are doing okay. And it is not humanly down to my wife and I alone. I stand as a parent on the shoulders of all the helpers that have been contributing to my, my children's life. And I'm saying if you want to see your children develop in that way, get helpers around you. But for you who will be helpers, these are the ways you can become a helper. Amen. Because also, if you need an added incentive, listen to what it says. In Exodus 20, verse 21, about these children. Exodus 1, verse 20 and 21. Listen to what it says about Shepher and Puah. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. In 2008, I was doing my master's. I was sitting down. I got a call from my older sister. She said, are you sitting down? When somebody says, are you sitting down, you are scared. Right? So he said, are you sitting down? I said, yes. And she said, I want to tell you something, but please, okay. She said, Auntie Yam is pregnant. I almost fell off my chair. For 16 years, she had not been able to conceive. Not been able to conceive for 16 years. It was something that, it was one of the most painful things for our entire family. And the point is this, for somebody that poured into other people's children, that helped, why is this thing lacking? And after nine months, God gave her praise. Because God honors those who fear him. He gives them their own families. The Bible said he sets the lonely in families because he's the father of the fatherless and the husband of widows. I want to just say this over all the people I mentioned and the ones that I didn't mention, but even over some of you who is not my own kids, but it's other people's kids. May the Lord reward you for all your efforts. May the Lord send you help that is beyond the help that you have rendered. May the blessing that came upon Shepherd and Puah rest upon you. For where you are still looking for your own child, I say in the name of Jesus, you will handle those babies your own. I say in the name of Jesus, where you are looking for a life partner, the God, Lord will give you the right partner in the name of Jesus Christ. That leads me to my final point. You know, somebody would say something like this, you know, now nah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm really good because, you know, I don't need... It's not that these things can't be helpful, but 
I don't need the drama of other people in my life. Raising these children is already hard enough. And I won't say, please don't make that mistake. In fact, I think you're making a, a categorical mistake. What do I mean by categorical mistake? You are mistaking what is preferential helpfulness with essential helpfulness. What's the difference? If I told you, spend more time, spend time. If you want to, be, you want to have a successful marriage, spend time with your spouse. That's essential helpfulness. If I say, this is the way you can spend time with your spouse, that's preferential. If I say, eat a good, with a good, di- a good diet for your health, that's essential. If I say, here are the things that you can eat, that's preferential. If I say, go to church, that's essential. If I say, go to this church or that church, that's preferential. When I'm saying you must do collaborative parenting or you must be involved, you must help people in collaborating in their own parenting, it is not preferential, it is essential. And why is it essential? Not just because of all the things I said, but because of this real point. The God in whose image we are created, the God who is the savior of the entire world, he embraced collaborative parenting to save the world. In fact, salvation, what we call salvation, the narrative of salvation is replete with God who is a collaborative savior. Just think about the final week of Jesus' life. Jesus at, at the beginning of the week is entering Jerusalem. He wants to enter Jerusalem, but he doesn't want to walk. He needs an animal to ride upon. And so he doesn't have one. But he tells his disciples, go into the city. You will find a coat that is, that is tied there and bring it and tell the person the master has need of it. Collaboration. Eventually, getting towards the middle of the week, Jesus says he wants to celebrate this Passover, the last Passover, because he's going to institute something called the Lord's Supper that will be here with his people till he returns. That reminds the people of him. He wants to institute this holy meal, but he doesn't have a place to celebrate this Passover with his children, but he tells, with his disciples, but he tells them, go and find this person, and this person will give you this in. Why? The master has need of it. Collaboration. But I can even be more explicit. On the way to Golgotha, on the way to paying for the sins of all mankind, on the way to paying for the sins of all those that will believe in him, on the way for taking the curse that was upon us so that we can live with God forever, Jesus is carrying his cross and he's about to get there, but he stumbles because he's weak. So lies the fate of all humanity. But there was a man called Simon of Cyrene and he was able to help Jesus carry the cross, collaboration. But that body needed not to be on the cross. It needed to be buried and come out from the grave. It was to resurrect. But who was going to speak and get the body of Jesus Christ? The disciples couldn't because they'd all fled. It needed someone with power, stepping a man called Joseph of Arimathea. He goes to advocate before Pilate to get the body of Jesus Christ. But also there's something missing. He doesn't have a tomb. And so he takes his own tomb and buries Jesus there. Can you see what I'm saying? The whole gospel narrative has the collaboration of God with human beings ripe in it. Collaborative salvation. To which somebody then says, yeah, but that's the final week. Oh, but the final week only happens because this is something that has happened at the very beginning. Listen, the most mysterious statement I find in all of scripture is this. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh. Why say it is the most stupendous thing? Why? The word is God. The word is creator. How does the creator dwell in the world of the things that he created? The most mysterious thing you ever hear. How does Steve Jobs enter into the world of microchips? It doesn't make sense. But let us leave the mystery aside and let us ask why the word had to become flesh. The word had to become flesh because there is a spiritual principle at play. Maybe I can illustrate it this way. You know why fans never carry the trophy, the Champions League trophy. Man City fans never carry it. Why? Because even though their team won, they did not participate in it. If you're ever going to win or lose at something, you must first participate in the thing that you're doing. And in the same way, the word had to become flesh because the people that he was coming to save, they were flesh and blood. 
That's why he did not become an angel. Give me Hebrews 2, verse 14. This is what he says. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. Verse 16. In their humanity. For surely it is not angels he helps. Why? He did not become an angel because he wasn't saving fallen angels. He became a human being because he wanted to save what? Fallen humans. But Abraham's descendants, verse 17. For this reason he had to be made like them. Fully human in every way. So question, if he was going to be human, if he was going to enter the human world, how was he going to do it? We know that at the end of his life, the body needed a tomb. But if he was going to enter the world, he needed a womb. And God didn't have a womb. But thank God there was a young lady called Mary. She had a womb that could contain the God that created her. God was already collaborating in this most mysterious thing we call the incarnation. He needed a womb and that was where his collaborative parenting of his son began. And even after that, let me say something that will seem blasphemous. But Jesus needed people that were going to change his nappies. Jesus needed people that were going to feed him milk. Jesus needed people that would help him when he was crawling. Jesus needed people that would help him when he was walking. And that was where Mary and Joseph were. Was he the son of Mary and Joseph? Yes. But he was also the son of God. Because Mary and Joseph were there to collaborate with God to raise the savior of the world. Listen. And I'll say this and I mean it. I dare say that Jesus does not become the savior that he is without the input of Mary and Joseph. Our salvation is collaborative, not just because of what happens at the end, but what happens at the beginning. God collaborated with human beings to parent his son so that he can save the world. If God did that, then to save your children and to save the children of others, God needs you to free your children for collaborative parenting. And God needs you to participate in the parenting of other people. Shall we rise to our feet?